can hear you. <laughs> we can see slides and we can hear you. We're feeling Yay. good. Okay. I am so sorry about all the technical problems. And I will also say that my computer has completely descended into the black screen of death. So I'm now on the laptop. <laughs> We may have to have a burial later today, but anyway, keep your fingers crossed. And um, I'll also say that uh, Sarah is a very tough act to follow, but I will do my best. So um, hope everybody got a nice little break. And I'm just gonna quickly show you the slides that hopefully you can see now that you missed before. So um, these are some of the wildlife that are a potential nuisance for our gardeners in this area. And um, there's others, but these are going to be the most common ones that you're going to get questions about. And as I said, um, sometimes it's really easy to tell. You can see when you've got a problem, you might see the critter, but other times you're going to have to look for um, some of the signs uh, that they leave behind. And the pictures probably help what I was talking about before. So example, the, the leaves here, um, if you see very clean, clean cuts, you're going to think rabbits. Um, whereas rough and jagged edges that are torn, you're going to think deer. Um, if your damage is right down at the root level, um, think voles. Um, and there's a couple different types of voles. So if it's root stripping, which is under the ground, you're going to think pine voles. Whereas if the damage is right at the root collar, you're going to think meadow voles because they live above ground. So once you've identified the damage and the likely culprit, then what are your next steps? And experts in the field are recommending an approach that you probably have heard by now called IPM or Integrated Pest Management. And this is basically avoiding the shotgun approach. So first you want to assess the need for control. So ask yourself, how serious is the damage? And is it something that you can tolerate? Is it localized or is it pretty extensive? Hey, what's up? Yeah? We just lost slides. I'm gonna pull them up on my computer and you can just narrate, okay? Okay. Oh wait, now they're back. <laughs> that is weird. <laughs> they're back, okay. If we have, well, let's keep going. If it happens once more, I'm just gonna like, and we're gonna go to mine with you narrating, but I think we're good for now. All right, are we on integrated <laughs> management? We are, this is fun. <laughs> it keeps us on our toes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, so I think I said, uh, uh, is this something that's going to go away without any intervention? Uh, and then next, you're going to need to weigh the cost, the potential cost to intervention. So consider that you may need a permit to trap or kill some wildlife. And do you even want to kill the problem creature? Are your interventions going to be humane? Uh, do you have restrictive covenants in your neighborhood regarding fences or barking dogs? Do you have neighbors that might mind electric fences or putrid smelling sprays or clumps of human hair spread along your property line? So also consider the ecological impacts. So is your approach going to include something or anything that's toxic? Will it be selective for your target species? Um, you don't want to trap your neighbor's cat, for example. And how will removal of the wildlife affect the remaining species in your landscape? So for example, if you decide you wanna get rid of snakes in your yard, how is that going to impact a possible vole population that you might have had? Or if you put up deer or bird netting, um, is that gonna potentially trap snakes in it? Or are you going to um, um, keep out butterflies or other pollinators from those plants? So often the best approach is gonna be a multi-pronged attack that takes all of these factors into account. And importantly, when you're weighing the pros and cons, you wanna really think long-term. So for example, a deer fence might be expensive up front, but it also might be the most economical approach in the long-term. All right, my slide's not advancing. I think, Ashley, you're gonna be up. We're calling it. Okay, great. Let me pull my slides up and make sure I'm on page. Any good? Uh, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's nothing worse than watching a PowerPoint where you're kind of bored and it would be hard to be bored during this. Can you guys see that? All right, next slide. <laughs> I need like yes, a ma'am. <laughs> <Ding, ding. laughs> All right, now I can watch it on my screen. Oh dear. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. 
And I spend more time discussing deer since with the expanding or ever expanding deer population, it seems that there are very few gardeners who are not gonna have to deal with deer at some point or another. And there's a lot of interest in protecting landscapes from deer damage. Next. So gardeners often know when they have a deer problem because you, uh, it's easy to see the deer or their droppings or the damage that they're leaving behind, which is generally from ground level up to about six feet in height. And as we probably know, deer will eat almost anything. And that includes vegetables, row crops, ornamentals, shrubs, and fruit trees. And as I mentioned before, they lack upper incisors so that the browsed areas are gonna show the, the damage they cause to saplings and, and small trees can be pretty significant. Next, there are several different strategies for deterring deer and the three main categories that we're gonna talk about are repellents, exclusion, and cultural practices. And these are the plants that you select and then how you grow them. Next. So repellents include scare tactics, area repellents, and contact repellents. So next. So scare tactics, um, this could be like a barking dog, lights or a radio left on in the garden or a motion detector that activates something such as a, a jet of water. And these can be effective in some situations. So if you use these early on before the deer have established patterns in your yard, they could work um, or for very small areas that can be effective. But the problem with these is that the deer quickly become desensitized to these tactics. Next. So area repellents repel by odor and some examples, there are many examples, such as soap, hair, coyote urine, garlic juice, blood meal, milorganite, and fish emulsion. And you've probably heard of others as well. And these two might work for a while, but generally they're not gonna be a good long-term solution. Next. So contact repellents repel by both taste and odor. And these are things that you're gonna spray directly onto your plants. And there's a lot of products on the market and you can also mix up your own concoction with eggs and hot sauce for um, a fraction of the price. So this strategy can actually be highly effective, but it does have several disadvantages. Number one, it can be really expensive, especially if you're using um, the commercial sprays and it's really labor intensive. It's not gonna protect new growth. Um, you have to keep spraying things as they're growing in the spring that can be a lot of spraying. Um, and it, it takes a lot of time to spray lots of plants and you really have to be diligent year round. Next. So where the sprays can be really useful is if you have a, a small area or say an area that you visit frequently and is convenient to spray. Um, an example might be like a, a mailbox garden. You go down and check your mail for those of us who still get mail every day, um, but you can bring your little spray bottle down and, and spritz your plants regularly. Uh, or for seasonal uses like annuals, you wanna put pansies out in the fall. And so you're only gonna spray for a few months. And then if your plants do get eaten, your investment isn't quite as large. And here I have a recipe for a deer spray that's really inexpensive. I used this for many, many years and it was really effective if you stay on top of it. Um, and the sprays can be pretty exciting until you come to the realization that you're gonna be spraying every week or two for the rest of your life. Next. But never fear, there are more options. Um, exclusion is basically fencing, and that's whether you're fencing the deer out or the plants in. And with fencing, um, you wanna consider four things, and these are cost, aesthetics, effectiveness, and maintenance. And the challenge is it can be difficult to optimize all four of these in one product. So each person is gonna to have to prioritize the criteria and you may need to make some trade-offs. So you have to decide what criteria are most important to you. Oh, you Sorry, I'm trying to get good, Lisa. No, you're good. <laughs> I, I can't be it. trusted. Uh, good. So electric fence is one option, and this can be really relatively inexpensive and easy to install, and it can be quite effective. However, they do require a good bit of maintenance, and it might not be the best choice if you've got children or pets around. An electric fence can be as simple as a single wire that's run about 30 inches from the ground. Um, they also have woven wire electric fences. 
and, um, and you can add multiple strands of electric wire if you have heavy beer pressure. And on the lower right-hand corner, I took this picture many years ago, but I was completely amazed that this homeowner had no fewer than seven wires and handles on their electric beer fence, which I can't imagine how long it took them to come and go from that fence. Um, but uh, one of the disadvantages, disadvantages is you have to keep the ground under the fence clear because um, they can become grounded by tall vegetation and then they don't work. And they also do cost money to operate. And if you have a power failure, they're not going to be operational as well. Next. So there's options in non-electric fencing. Um, and if you don't want to go with the traditional eight foot fence that is often recommended for deer, uh, you could try a five foot fence that slants outward 60 degrees that confuses the deer's depth perception. Uh, I have to admit, I've read this, but never actually seen a fence like this. I'm not sure how you would put that in, but um, another option that I've read about is two woven wire fences that are each five to six feet tall and placed four to five feet apart. Um, so this arrangement doesn't give the deer enough room to land after jumping in. And again, it's hard to imagine starting out with something like this, but if you had a piece of property that already had an existing fence that wasn't tall enough and you had a lot of room, it might be an option to put a second um, shorter fence in this configuration. So in these pictures, I like this garden because the homeowner chose a solid fence. And on the right um, is the original six foot fence. And then on the left um, picture, the lower left, um, he took the same fence and cut it down to five feet in an ornamental pattern and painted it. And the reason that this is working, and you can see it's working because of all the nice hostas he has growing in there, is that the deer are often reluctant to jump a fence if they can't see on the other side. And regardless of whatever fence you use, make sure your driveways and entrances are secured and keep those gates closed because the deer will walk right into an open gate. Next. So another option um, in exclusion is deer fencing. And most of you are probably well aware of um, deer fencing. This is a, a type of fence that made, that's made specifically for deer and um, when I do this talk in person, I have a bunch of examples because they've come out with more and more types of, of mesh of different gauges, thicknesses, and openings. Um, so they're, they're different strengths and prices as well. But the neat thing about this stuff is it's nearly invisible. It's generally about seven or eight feet high. And the deer are reluctant to jump it because they can't see the top very well and they're not sure exactly how high they need to jump. This is also a fencing that you can install yourself. It's not super cheap, but it's usually far less expensive than some other traditional fencing. And if you install it correctly, it can be really effective. So the correct installation is super important. Um, you wanna make sure you use the ground stakes as instructed, uh, or the deer will push right underneath your fence. There's also a reinforcing cable that you can put along the top and that's very helpful because it keeps the fence from sagging and also, especially if you're in the woods, it keeps um, fallen limbs from landing on your fence and tearing it. Now this type of fence, it can last a long time, but it's not gonna last forever and it does require some maintenance. So you have to keep checking it to look for tears and, and breaches in it. But it's really ideal for wooded areas. If you've, um, if you've got a lot of woods, it blends in really easily. You don't need as many posts if you can use trees to attach it. Um, you can also purchase gates for driveways and, and other access. And um, as you can see in the lower uh, picture, you can get really elaborate options for your driveway. But um, of course, things like this are going to drive your cost up a little bit. So next, if you're not quite ready to put in um, the big deer fence, or if you only have a really small area to protect, you can start small and use some of the um, the netting options or the smaller, uh, more lightweight mesh options that, um, that you can find at a lot of different places now. These are really inexpensive. They're almost invisible, which is really appealing. And they're also easily removed or reconfigured if you wanna change your, your garden shape. Uh, they do require a lot of maintenance. Um, and if the deer really wanna get in or bump into it or something bumps into it, they can be easily breached. Um, but in some situations, they can be really effective. Um, the mesh is usually pretty easy to work with. They generally come in rolls of different heights. 
Um, they're easily cut to different heights or lengths and you can use wooden stakes or um, metal poles or bamboo or trees or, or other things to support the netting. Um, but just like with the deer fence, you wanna make sure that you anchor it to the ground. Otherwise the deer are gonna push right underneath it. Next. And then don't forget to consider access to the area that you fence. Um, don't enclose the whole thing and realize you can't get in there to do anything. So um, this gardener used, uh, made a very simple gate using two pairs of screw hooks and then they just stapled the netting um, to the wood and made a nice little gate there. Next. And lastly, you can protect individual plants um, either with the netting or the mesh draped over the plant um, or using a section of wire fence in some cases to protect the plant. So on the lower left, this is a magnolia tree that has been fenced to keep the rutting bucks from destroying the lower limbs of the tree. And once the tree is big enough, it's probably gonna be um, safe from the bucks and, and the fencing can be removed. And the lower right picture, um, this is a deer favorite, this oak leaf hydrangea. And um, this gardener planted it first, they planted it amongst more deer resistant plants to make it a little uh, less easy to spot. And then I don't know if you can see, but if you look really closely, it's protected by a circle of wire fencing that's about four feet tall in there. And, um, and the deer are not able to reach in to, to get that plant. And um, in a lot of cases, the fencing only needs to be in place until the tree is tall enough to be out of the deer's reach, which is basically more than six feet tall. So one of the disadvantages of the strategy is it can be difficult to get inside the fenced area if you need to prune or to weed or to mulch. In the top right, um, this is a row of azaleas that is protected by netting, so it's almost invisible. Um, it's draped over the plants and secured at the bottom. If you do use a netting drape like this, you have to make sure that the plant doesn't grow through the netting. Um, so you have to keep kind of pulling it up and loosening it because um, anything that grows through the netting is number one, going to be vulnerable to deer. And number two, <laughs> if, you, if it gets too big and you pull the netting off, you just rip off all your new growth, which is very discouraging. But um, one advantage to this that I, um, I didn't realize until the fall was it made the leaf cleanup really easy because you just brush the leaves off the top and you don't have to pick the leaves out of your azaleas, which is always a, a fun fall chore. Next. So the third type of strategy is cultural practices. And this is namely the plants that you select for your garden and then the conditions that you're providing for them. So first I'm gonna talk about choosing plants. Next. So rule number one is, and this is an important one, is very few plants are going to be completely deer proof. Um, the one uh, exception to this rule are the plants in this picture, which are 100% deer proof because they're plastic, but most people don't want to go that route. <laughs> so you can find lots of lists of deer resistant plants, but I would urge anybody to to proceed cautiously before you make huge investments based on a list. Um, I have a list too, and uh, I think Ashley was gonna upload it so you can look at it. I started, this list was, I realized from 2006. So Laurel Babcock helped me to do a little updating on the list. Um, it was interesting. She's our, one of our native plant add in. So we've got some of those to choose from. Am I still there? I just got a sign thing. I was unstable. Sorry, I'm muted and I'm trying to like encourage you. Anyway, no. <laughs> yeah, you're still here. We lost you for a second, but you were just talking. Oh, don't do this to me. But No, we lost you for a second, but I think you were just saying that Laurel helped you add some native plants to your list. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so hopefully you'll be able to access that list. And again, this is one that I developed based on my own personal experiences. And I put asterisks by plants that I felt like or feel like are, are really the most deer resistant plants. And unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to trial a lot of the native plants. I'm guessing that the things like the grasses and things are going to be super deer resistant, but um, I would really like to try more of these and, and see what are deer resistant so we can really promote some of the native plants. Um, one of the things that we did do is we went through 
and had to remove a lot of the um, original plants because they are now on invasive lists and we don't really want to promote invasive plants. Um, sadly, the invasive plants are the ones that have no hosts around here, including the deer. So <laughs> they're often the ones that tend to be deer resistant, but it's a, that double-edged sword. Um, next, I'm going to go through some plants that you may or may not be familiar with, but, um, but are some favorites of mine that are more deer resistant. So this is Daphne odora, and it's a, a super fickle plant. You have to have excellent drainage to grow it, but it is really worth the effort for its wonderful winter fragrance. Just really nice blooms all through the winter. It's an evergreen plant. So if you can grow it, I highly recommend it. Um, also tolerates a lot of shade. And I talk a lot about shade plants because that's really what I have in my garden. So I may be leaning that way a bit more. Next. False holly or Osmanthus heterophilus. Um, this is a variegated variety, um, is another good evergreen choice. Next, another false holly, Osmanthus. This is Goshiki, which is um, a really uh, uh, lively, uh, colorful one I like for shady areas. Next, the Cryptomerias coming up are. Uh, <laughs> Um, are good choices for evergreen shrubs. Um, this one stays pretty small. Next, Florida anise or Elysium. Um, this is a good native choice. It's an evergreen, tolerates a lot of shade. I've never had the deer eat this one. Um, Haley's Comet has really nice reddish flowers. Uh, next, Rainbow Leucothoe. Um, is uh, another one that's a little tricky to grow. It likes good drainage, but um, deer don't tend to eat the leucothoes. Next, sarcococca or sweet box, um, yet another evergreen shade lover. Uh, I will say that um, along with Pachysandra, this one is susceptible to the boxwood blight that is a, a fungal disease that's been um, attacking some of the boxwoods in, in eastern states. So I don't know if you all have had any trouble with the boxwood blight, but if you have and you have boxwoods, um, this would not be a good choice because uh, it'll probably succumb to that. Next, box honeysuckle or Lanicera nidida uh, is a, another good deer resistant choice. Next, Vicariopterus or bluebeard. Um, is a, a nice one, likes a little bit more sun, but comes in a lot of different varieties. Next, this is the Caryopteris divericata, which is a really pretty variegated form of this plant. Next, the sedges or Carex. Um, again, some, uh, some of these are evergreen, not all of them, but um, also tend to be more deer resistant. Next, cat mint. Um, which is not catnip. Um, catmint or nipita is, um, doesn't reseed and, and spread like the catnip, but it's a, a, a really nice, well-behaved clump generally and super deer resistant. Lavender is another choice. Uh, also, again, good drainage and lots of sun for that one. Next, some of your spring bulbs. Daffodils, you can't go wrong with daffodils. I, um, somebody's gonna prove me wrong probably, but I have not seen anything bother daffodils, um, the bulbs or the foliage. So always a good choice. Uh, also hyacinths and scillas. I have these, but I will say that the deer have been eating some of my hyacinths. Um, as soon as they start to come up, sometimes they'll rip the whole bulb out of the ground and then, then decide they don't like it, which is very frustrating. But Worth a try. Squirrels will not stop digging. Oh, okay. Well, maybe the squirrels are getting them. <laughs> I'll get to them too. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll cover squirrels. Next, uh, Artemisia. Um, this is one called Silver Mound. Um, Poe's Castle is another one. And make sure you know what you're getting because Artemisia comes in both clumpers and runners and the the running form of Artemisia has actually reached the um, invasive list so you don't want to plant uh, one of those that's going to uh, uh, take off and, and I 
the next sunny areas. Um, verbascum uh, and Russian sage are uh, really good for those areas and um, good deer resistant. Next. But before planting anything, you want to really carefully consider your growing conditions. And I hope you all have heard this master gardener mantra, but it's you want to put the right plant in the right place. And this is really, really so true. So go out and observe how much sun or shade your site receives. If it's wet or dry, is it protected or exposed? Consider getting a soil sample. You wanna check your, your pH and your fertility because your goal is gonna to be to select plants that are gonna thrive in the conditions that you already have. And then you're gonna look for ways to optimize those conditions, such as amending the soil, improving your drainage, mulching, fertilizing, watering as needed. And what that, that's gonna give you is a more vigorous and faster growing plant that's gonna be better able to bounce back if it does get munched on by the deer. And if you've got sun, that's helpful too, because it gives you a huge advantage because plants just grow faster in the sun. So for example, um, forsythia, a lot of people don't know that the deer actually do browse on forsythia. It's one of those plants that grows so fast and vigorous that you just don't even notice that the deer are, are probably helpfully pruning it back. Um, Lantana is another example like that. People often say that um, Ms. Huff is a real popular lantana but we'll, because it's evergreen, or not evergreen, sorry, perennial around here. Um, and the deer do nibble it, but it's such a vigorous grower that it, it can tolerate some deer browse. So next slide. These are some pictures. Um, this is a, a, an example of the right plant in the right place in the sun advantage. So this is a, a gardener in my neighborhood um, which is a heavily deer infested area. And these plants are given ideal conditions and you can see that everything is really lush and full. Next. And this is the same garden, um, just a different place. The plants in here are so vigorous that they probably discourage deer just because it's so hard for the deer to get into to browse them. And if there is a little bit to browse, it's gonna be hardly noticeable. Next. This is just um, a different view of um, the same garden, but a different place. This, you know, this gardener knows what plants to put in the right place. And so next, given all of these strategies, how do you put all this together? Next slide. You got that, Ashley? Did you go to the next one? There you go. <laughs> it might be my computer. No, you're good. I just keep trying to respond to you, but I've muted myself. So I oh, am constantly now, behind. Now I got to go back. Is that the one you wanted? Are you on the words now? Yes, I am on the words now. I think you might have lost your connection for a second. But we can hear you now. And I'm okay, now it's back. Okay. I'm sorry. No, you're good. It's fun. I get to like have a brief moment where my heart stops and say, can't hear you for a second. I go, oh my God. No, we're totally fine. We're catching it. It's great. Okay. Well, maybe we're waking people up too. <laughs> yeah, I keep them on the edge of their seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What's coming next or not? <laughs> so basically, I've told you a lot of strategies. So how do you put all this together? Hanging on my every last word. Thank you. I appreciate the support out there. <laughs> um, so how do you put all these together? And your best bet is going to be to use basically a combination of strategies. So you may end up having some of your yard fenced. You may use deer resistant plants in other areas. And you might want to um, use repellents in other areas. So one thing that's been really helpful, I think, is to think of your landscape in terms of zones where the zones are based on the number of susceptible plants in an area and the level of protection that's needed. So a high intensity zone is gonna be something that has a lot of vulnerable plants. This might be like a vegetable garden or a rose garden, or maybe even your whole backyard. And you're probably gonna to wanna to fence an area like this or at least be able to spray it really consistently. So a medium security zone um, is something that you might be able to protect with netting, 
or treat with repellents, but maybe not as consistently. And generally the plants in these areas are gonna need to be somewhat less favorable to the deer. Um, you might have some tastier selections interspersed. Um, but this could also be an area that has lower deer pressure. So, so maybe right up against your house. A lot of people say that the areas um, right in front of their houses or along their houses, the deer tend to avoid more. And then the unprotected zones are often gonna be like the perimeter of your property or areas that you're um, not able to keep a close eye on. And plants in this zone need to be really the more deer resistant selections and um, vigorous plants that can tolerate some deer browsing. And the advantage of this ap approach is that it clusters your areas into different levels of protection so that you can concentrate your efforts at deterring the deer. Um, if you have vulnerable plants that are scattered throughout your landscape, it just becomes really difficult to, to try to protect them all and, and to manage it. And lastly, I would just say don't give up and because gardening with deer does take a little bit more planning and effort, but you can have your garden um, with the deer. And one trick that I've learned is to look around and see what your neighbors and other gardeners are doing and how they're succeeding despite the deer. And so what I've done next, um, next slide, is to just go through and, and show you pictures that I took pretty much in my own neighborhood of gardeners that were um, having successful gardens in heavy deer pressure areas. So in this one, there's this is all herbs and herbs can be really ornamental. I mean, there's probably seven or eight different types of herbs in just this one shot and um, super deer resistant. And also you can use them in cooking. Next. There's another picture that has um, a lot of herbs. You can see probably rosemary in there and then some of those evergreen um, shrubs in the background, the cryptomeria. Next. This is one that's got um, verbena that's blooming in the front that the deer have left alone. And you can see some nice silvery lamb's ear in the back. Um, just a nice little combination here. Next. Amsonia hubrechtii, that's the, um, the plant in the back. That's a, a, a native, more to Texas, but um, also there's a, the native Amsonia with the bigger leaves. Um, that's a really nice native choice. That's really deer resistant. Next. This um, is a, was a master gardener's garden that was all deer resistant shrubs, grasses, ferns, and then you say, wait, aren't those impatience in the front? Isn't that deer candy? And yes, indeed. And what she told me is that every week she goes out and sprays her impatience that are right along that front border. And she can manage those. So she has her nice little pop of color knowing that everything else in the background um, is not gonna be eaten by the deer. Next. So foxglove, um, that's a, a really good choice. Uh, I don't know of anything that eats foxglove because it has uh, digitalis, uh, makes it toxic to animals and people. Um, the salvia is the plant that's blooming in the background. Next, this is um, boxwood shrubs, a, a peony and a cleome. That's an annual that has really good deer resistance too. It's not blooming now, but has, or spider flower, maybe you've heard of that. That's one that I use a lot and it'll reseed um, and the deer leave that alone. Next. This is um, another nice deer resistant little garden alongside of a, a walkway. Um, I think these are Campanula that are blooming and uh, she said the deer were not eating those. Next. So this is um, irises and um, this is a spirea. This is another one of those sort of controversial plants because the species spirea have, um, are now on an invasive list. And um, we're told that the, um, the cultivars of spirea, which I'm sure this is one because it's quite beautiful um, and nicely deer resistant are supposedly sterile, but there is some controversy as to whether they are actually completely sterile. So um, that's the subject of another talk though. 
Next. Uh, ornamental grasses, always a good choice. There's another um, peony and some yarrow and the pretty plant in the front is a tansy. Next. This is a nice, um, full, lush uh, example of deer-resistant plants. Um, the yellow-flowered ones are euphorbias. And there's a um, amsonia, the blue star amsonia is the little blue flowers in the front, if you can see those. Next. And I think this is my last picture. I really like this one because it's just got the nice silvery foliage and. Um, this is that napita or catmint in the front and then rose campion in the back, uh, another fuzzy leaved plant that um, tends to have better deer resistance. So that is my last deer slide. And just as a, a brief follow up, I will tell you that over the years I've been through every single one of these strategies and we have finally installed around most of our property a um, a big old more solid deer fence and it's one of those things that I say why didn't we do this 20 years ago but sometimes you just have to work through the but um, but yeah that's one of those where sometimes that initial investment really pays off because it's so much fun to not have to deal with the deer next slide um, and now I can focus all my attention on the rabbits that are invading my garden among other things. So if it's not one thing, it's something else. And the cottontail rabbit is definitely one that you're going to hear about. It can really um, <laughs> do a lot of damage. I know it's only up to two feet high, but they can really uh, eat up some of your plants. And you often can see the, the rabbits eating away in your garden. Um, sometimes you do have to identify them by the damage that they're causing. Next slide. So in the spring and the summer, um, uh, a lot of times people think they've got deer damage, but again, the damage is, is going to be two feet high or less. And because of those uh, really sharp upper incisors, the leaves and the shoots are going to show very clean cuts. Um, in the fall and the winter, they actually can cause pretty extensive damage to trees and shrubs because they gnaw on bark and um, can even girdle them, which, which will eventually kill those plants. So they are definitely a pain. Next. There are a number of strategies that are useful um, in controlling rabbit damage, but the thing to remember is that they have incredible reproductive potential and everyone's probably heard the sayings about rabbits and they are all true. A rabbit can have um, it, more than five or six litters in a year and on average a pair of rabbits is going to produce 18 babies a year. So the bottom line is that it's not really feasible or desirable to try to eliminate a rabbit population entirely. Um, but luckily, um, if you can hold out, the rabbit populations do tend to cycle. So if you're having a really bad year, um, they often the next year or two will be better um, as the, their populations go up and down. And there are a lot of predators that they eventually will fall prey to. So um, some of the things that are in your arsenal um, will be exclusion, habitat modification, repellents, and then trapping or shooting. Next slide. So under exclusion, this is probably going to be the most effective means of keeping rabbits away from your plants. And you really only need a, a two foot high fence. It might be funny looking, but that will keep rabbits out. Um, it doesn't even need to be particularly sturdy but you either need to bury it or keep it very tight to the ground so that they don't push underneath it. You also need to make sure that your mesh size is an inch or less. And um, because it, as I said, um, the rabbit population is gonna consist of a lot of younger rabbits. And I thought I had protected my little vegetable garden with a, a little perimeter of fencing and I watched uh, I went out and looked and saw a very young rabbit munching away on my plants and I yelled at him and it went through the fence as if there was no fence there. <laughs> so make sure that your um, mesh size is small enough to keep them out. Uh, you can also protect individual trees um, or plants using hardware cloth with a quarter inch size mesh. And um, again, you're going to need to bury the bottom. And there is a, a 
tape that you can also buy that you can wrap around the trunks of trees to keep the rabbits from um, gnawing on them, but you have to take it off in the summertime when they're not eating the bark so that you can allow for the growth of the trees. You can also put um, chicken wire cages or domes around individual plants. Um, and especially if there's tender new growth that, that is especially susceptible to the rabbits. Next slide. Habitat modification can be really useful because rabbits like the cover of brush piles, debris, tall vegetation, um, any other hiding places. So if you can remove these or move them farther away from your desirable plants, that, that um, can also discourage them. Next. Repellents can also be effective. Um, area repellents, um, as I said before, protect by odor. And one popular one that can be effective is dried blood meal. You can scatter that around your plants, but um, sometimes that can attract dogs. So just be aware of that. Contact repellents, um, those are things that you're gonna spray directly on your plants, tend to be a little bit more effective, but you've got to keep spraying new growth to protect that. Um, there's a lot of products that are on the market that are formulated specifically for rabbits, but just like with deer, if the rabbits are hungry enough, they may eat your plants regardless of, of what you put on them. Next. Rabbits are considered a game animal um, and thus are protected. So you'll need a permit to trap or kill them. Um, trapping can be useful in urban or suburban areas, um, but uh, consult with a wildlife damage control agent about necessary permits and release procedures because you don't want to release them where they're gonna be a nuisance to someone else. And in areas where shooting is acceptable, um, allowing access to hunters can help reduce the rabbit population. And also don't forget that your, um, the predators that are around can also help keep your rabbit numbers in check. So uh, be tolerant of uh, hawks, owls, and yes, snakes, because they can take out some of the baby rabbits too. Next. So we get a lot of questions about moles and voles. These are super common. And what's interesting is that a lot of people don't even know that there's a difference between moles and voles. They see tunnels and they usually think um, moles, but the control of each of these is different. So it's really important to know which one you're dealing with. Next. So we'll start with moles and moles are primarily carnivores. And that means the moles are not eating your plants. Um, so that's important to remember. The moles are actually eating the grubs and worms and beetles and insect larvae that are living in your soil. And they are incredible diggers and they will tunnel extensively every day in search of food. And now the root systems um, can, of your plants can be disrupted by the tunneling. So you may see some damage that way. Um, and, but mostly people just don't like all the tunnels in their, their lawns and gardens because they, they look bad. Next. There is a mole called the star-nosed mole. Um, and it's one of um, several types of moles that is at risk of becoming endangered. So the, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission has actually protected moles by law. And that means that you have to obtain a, a permit from the commission before you can trap moles. Next. So voles, on the other hand, um, these can cause extensive damage to your gardens and landscapes because they are vegetarians and they will eat plants and roots and bark. And in our area, there's two main types of moles. There's other moles, but what you're mostly gonna be dealing with are pine voles and meadow voles. And the pine voles live underground in tunnel systems. So most of the damage that they cause is gonna be below the soil line where you can't see it. And meadow voles, they tend to live above the ground, um, mostly in grassy areas, and they're gonna cause damage that's at um, or just above the soil line, like right at the, the root collar of plants. Now, both of these types of voles will occupy mole tunnels if they're around. So if you see big tunnels, but then you see golf ball sized exit holes along the tunnels, you probably have voles that are using mole tunnels because moles almost never leave their tunnels. So look for those exit holes. Um, that'll help you dis to distinguish between the two. Next slide. But one method that you can use 
um, to help determine if you have moles or voles is called the apple sign test. Um, and this test is also useful in monitoring, if you already know you have voles, it helps to monitor vole populations to see if your control strategies are working. So what you wanna do is in, in several different locations where you have tunnels, you're gonna carefully remove the top of a tunnel and replace that with a shingle. Um, just something that basically covers it up like a roof to keep the light out. And then underneath that shingle, you're gonna put a little piece of an apple and leave it for 24 hours and then come back and check your sites. And if the apple has been eaten or is removed, then you know that you have voles that are using that run because the mole is gonna ignore it. Next slide. If you do have voles, um, they can be really challenging to get rid of. They are similar to rabbits in their reproductive potential. Um, some of your options are lethal, but um, to do that, you're gonna need to get a depredation permit from the Wildlife Resources Commission um, before you can kill any of them. And they can be killed by trapping or poisoning. Um, you can also remove or decrease favorable habitats um, and you can exclude voles from specific plants. There's a lot of um, products and gimmicks and ideas out there that are designed to scare or repel them, but unfortunately, there, um, none of these has been proven to be effective. Next. So trapping is probably gonna be one of your most effective ways if your population isn't too large and you really just use um, your regular old snap type mouse trap. You can bait it with um, the apple that's left over from your apple sign test, or mix up some peanut butter and oatmeal. That's another favorite. And then again, you, you're gonna need to excavate part of the tunnel that's um, active from your apple sign test. And you set the trap in the tunnel at a right angle to the run. And then you cover up the top of it with that shingle. So you, you keep the light out um, and then keep checking your traps to, to see how you're doing. Next slide. Um, there are several toxicants that are labeled for use against voles, but um, the most important thing with these is you really want to prevent exposure to pets or humans or anything else really besides voles. So if you do go this route, follow your label instructions very, very carefully. Next. Removing habitat that's favorable to voles um, can also be helpful. So think about keeping your grass and weeds mowed close, removing thatch, eliminating ground covers around um, susceptible plants. Um, clear the mulch away from, from tree trunks and shrubs, which you should already do anyway. You shouldn't be right up against the, the trunk. Um, you can also make your soil less hospitable by incorporating materials with sharp or rough edges like oyster shells. Um, and then there's other products out there designed for voles. I think um, Permatil is one that's advertised. We're not supposed to promote specific things, but um, I think that's one that uh, has been recommended. There um, aren't any specific recommendations for or against these in any of the extension material, um, but it may be worth a try if you've had a lot of problems with voles. And, and again, it's easiest to do this when you're putting plants in as opposed to after they're already planted. Next, you can prevent, uh, uh, protect individual trees or plants using that quarter inch hardware cloth, um, again, buried into the ground. Uh, this is uh, pretty labor intensive, but if you have high value uh, fruit trees or something it might be worthwhile. Uh, trying to fence an area to exclude voles is, is really not gonna be feasible. Next. So if you determine that it's moles and not voles that are your problem, first really ask yourself if you, um, if you need to control them or can you tolerate the tunnels in your yard. Um, moles can actually be beneficial. They are aerating the soil and they're eating the grubs that are potentially harming your lawn um, one of the grubs it turns into Japanese beetles, which most people aren't big fans of. So the moles are out there kind of doing your work for you. And often the damage that you're seeing is caused by just one or maybe two moles. It's amazing how much tunneling they can do. Um, if you feel that you must take control actions, you have two main options. 
trapping can be effective. They have special mole traps, um, but you, uh, you do need to get a permit for that. And you can also use a, a poison bait, um, a rodenticide. Um, that's if you know that you don't have a star-nosed mole. I'm not sure how you're going to know that, but um, again, that's one of the protected ones. But um, the hairy-tailed and eastern moles um, have been listed as um, official pests now and, and can be poisoned with the, the rodenticides. But again, be very, very careful using these so that you don't harm um, non-target species. Um, there was an older strategy that you will still read about, and that's by removing the food sources using insecticides that pretty much kill all the grubs, earthworms, insects, everything in the area. Um, and as we now know, this non-selective killing approach is, is probably going to have more negative effects on your soil health than the, uh, than the moles would ever have in the first place. So, um, uh, I just, I would not recommend this approach. And really one of the, the best things you can do is just to walk out and flatten your, the mole tunnels as you see them. Um, and it can be therapeutic to, to walk along all these mole tunnels and flatten them back down. And it may discourage them enough to move on to your neighbor's house and they can aerate their soil. Um, or they may eventually fall prey to one of the natural predators that they have. So next slide. So raccoons, I'm just going to mention them very briefly. Um, the, uh, they are nocturnal, and they're known for causing damage to watermelon and sweet corn, among other garden vegetables. They also um, get in garbage cans, and they do something called sod rolling. So if you've laid sod down, um, apparently they roll it back up in search of grubs and worms. Um, and they also can carry rabies. Next. Electric fence is, tends to be a good deterrent for raccoons. And you can also protect individual ears of corn by placing plastic bags over them or taping them up with this special tape. Um, this seems pretty labor intensive to me, but if you really like your homegrown corn, it may be worth the effort. Um, you can discourage raccoons from coming in the first place by removing some obvious food sources. Make sure you don't have pet food that's left out. Make sure your garbage cans are, are um, not accessible. And if you have to lay sod in the late summer or fall, um, apparently that's when sod rolling tends to be more of a problem, then you can pin the sod down um, in areas to keep them from rolling it up. And trapping is another possible option. But again, consult with a wildlife damage control agent um, to find out uh, if you need permits or where they can be released. The next slide. Uh, so I told you we would get to squirrels. And when I first did this talk, I did not even put squirrels in because I didn't think that squirrels were a pest. But apparently, they felt slighted by the omission because shortly after that, they started carrying off every single tomato that was growing on my plants, including the green ones. And I had figured out a long time ago how to feed the birds using, a, they have a great squirrel proof feeder and thought that that was all that was needed, but I was at a complete loss as to how to save my tomatoes from the squirrels. Very, very frustrating. Next slide. Um, squirrels eat a lot of things. They'll eat freshly planted seeds, tender sprouts, nuts, tomatoes, fruits, corn, flower buds on your trees, and I have seen all of this. They also like to dig, and they'll dig in your flower pots, and you've just planted something, and then squirrels dig it up. Um, they raid your bird feeders. They're also responsible for a surprising number of power outages when they scamper on the wires, and they short out transformers, and they also like to get into your house and nest in your attic. Next slide. And squirrels can be super challenging to control. Um, one approach is exclusion. So if you have squirrels getting in your attic, first watch them to see if you can see where they're getting in. And then you're going to need to seal all the openings that you can find with wire mesh and make sure that you're not trapping any squirrels on the inside. 
So one thing you can do is set a trap, like a have a heart live trap in your attic to catch any squirrels that may be on the inside and then put them back on the outside. And then you can also use a trap to ensure that you found all your access points. Um, Cause if they're still getting in, obviously you need to keep looking. Um, but do uh, make sure you check those traps frequently. If you have them in your attic, you, you don't wanna have um, a squirrel trapped in there and, and have them suffer unnecessarily. If you have isolated trees to protect, you can wrap um, the trunks of trees with a two foot wide metal band that's placed six feet up the tree. And any tree that's protected like this has to be all by itself, at least six to eight feet away from any other trees or structures, um, or the, the squirrels can obviously just jump right into the tree from something else. A garden area can be fenced with uh, one inch wire mesh or poultry wire. It doesn't have to be super high, but it does have to be buried or um, tight to the ground and reinforced with electric wire. Um, that will help keep them out of the gardens. And um, if you're planting bulbs, also consider putting um, chicken wire below and above the bulbs as you plant them and um, that'll keep the squirrels from digging up those bulbs. Next slide. You can also try changing the squirrels' routines by changing their habitats. Um, cutting back the limbs and branches so they're at least six feet away from your house is going to um, help keep them away from your house and out of your attic. Some people have had success feeding the squirrels if they put corn um, at a site that's distant from their bird feeders and other desirable plants. Um, that, sometimes that keeps them happy enough far away. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> the most effective control is going to be removing the squirrels, but this does require appropriate permits. Um, shooting is effective uh, where and when it is permitted. And wire cage traps, those, um, those live have a heart traps, can be used to catch squirrels um, and where they can be relocated. And Legally, they need to be relocated to private property with written permission of the landowner. Um, I'm just saying that, <laughs> but that's because they don't want, you don't want to, to leave a nuisance animal to be somebody else's problem. Um, you can bait your traps with fruits, nuts, or that peanut butter mixed with oatmeal. Um, make sure that you check your traps frequently so that they don't have to stay in there too long. And when you do relocate your squirrels, make sure you take them at least five miles and preferably 10 miles away, or you're gonna find them back in your garden before you get back. Next slide. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is snakes. And most people have a fear of snakes that's really out of proportion to the danger that they cause. Um, they don't actually cause any damage in gardens, and in fact, they eat rodents and insects that uh, might otherwise be pests in your garden, so they're, they're not so bad. Uh, most snakes are not aggressive, and they really want to avoid you probably as much as you want to avoid them. We only have three venomous snakes that are found in our area. Next slide. The canebrake rattlesnake is the first one, and I've never actually seen one of these in the wild. The second is the cottonmouth. That also tends to be more east of us. Um, that prefers wet areas. And then the last venomous snake um, is the copperhead. And that's actually fairly common. But luckily for us, that is the least lethal of all of these snakes. Uh, next slide. So all three of these venomous snakes are known as pit vipers. And you can distinguish these from non-venomous snakes by having a pit between the eye and the nostril. They will have long fangs and then a vertically elliptical cat's eye pupil. And when you get up close and personal with them, that's the best way to, to see that. I always laugh at that. So how close do you wanna to get to your snake to make sure it's a pit viper? Next slide. Here's some um, pictures to kind of show those differences. Um, I, I joke, but you actually can see this sometimes um, from not too far away if your eyes are good. Um, but they, they help to distinguish if you've got a copperhead or um, what's commonly confused with them is that one of the water snakes that people are, are scared of. But if you can see the rounded pupil and, and some of these characteristics, um, they can help you to know that maybe it's not 
necessarily a copperhead and, and doesn't need to be treated. Um, also, the some of the scales underneath them. Sometimes you can see this scale pattern in venomous versus non-venomous snakes in the, the shed skins that you might find. So you might know um, if you have had a venomous snake in the area, but um, like I said, you're probably not gonna flip your snake over to see his scales underneath. Next slide. So I talked about copperheads. They're gonna be the, the most likely venomous snake that you're gonna see in this area. So it's a good idea to be able to recognize them. They have a, a rusty patch on their head and these rust colored hourglass markings along the body. And the, the water snakes are the ones that are most often confused with them and their markings are sort of a reverse of this color pattern. So somebody told me once they look for um, chocolate chips along the side of the snake. And I thought that was a really good way to remember it. The, they look like it's a, like an hourglass marking that's thinner on the, the back side of the snake and along the sides they widen to um, like these little chocolate chips lined up along the side of the body. If you see this lime green yellowy tail, um, that indicates a young snake that's less than a year old. Um, so the baby copperheads are actually can be more dangerous than the adults because they tend to release all of their venom so, um, so don't think that because it's a baby, it's less dangerous. So next slide. The non-venomous snakes, they are gonna have lots of little bitty teeth. So if you were to get bitten um, and are wondering what bit you, you would see a horseshoe of tiny scratches rather than the two puncture marks. And most of these are not gonna be able to bite through clothing. Um, these are the ones with the round pupils and the large smooth cap over the top of their head that extends past the eyes. Next slide. There's a lot more non-venomous snakes than venomous. And these are just a few examples of uh, snakes that you might see. And as you can see, they come in all shapes and, and sizes and colors. Next slide. The best way to deal with snakes is simply leave them alone. Most snake bites occur when people try to handle or kill snakes. So leave them alone when you see them. Um, be cautious when walking through tall grass or working around rock or log piles. And if you are working in your garden, um, especially in snake favorable habitats, wear heavy gloves to protect your hands. Um, you can ask Sarah about that too. <laughs> Next slide. You can reduce the number of snake habitats in your yard by keeping your grass and weeds mowed, store firewood and lumber farther away from your living areas, and limit your mulch depth because that's going to discourage both snakes and then the rodents that the snakes are probably there to eat. Next. If you do need to relocate a non-venomous snake, you can sweep it into a box. Um, you can also carry a larger snake draped over a stick and move it to a, a safer place probably safer for you and not them. Next slide. Um, there may be some situations where you want to try to exclude snakes from an area. Um, for example, if you keep seeing a lot of venomous snakes, copperheads around, and you have an area that children or pets like to play, like a little play area, um, believe it or not, you can put up a snake fence. Next slide. To do this, it'll look something like this picture. Um, Basically, you use quarter inch wire mesh screening. Uh, it needs to be 30 inches high, but you angle it outward 30 degrees and uh, keep it tight to the ground and then keep it clear of vegetation on the outside so the snakes can't use that to, to climb over the fence. Next slide. Um, there really aren't any snake repellents that work, so don't bother. Next slide. And then there are lethal methods of snake control, but really you should only use those where um, confrontation is unavoidable or where there's a risk of injury to um, people or pets. And if you gotta do this, a long handled shovel or hoe can take care of matters. And interestingly, um, once the deed is done, make sure you don't try to handle the head of a venomous snake because even once it's dead, it has some reflex actions and you can actually still get bitten by the, the head of the snake. So kind of yucky, but keep that in mind. 
Next slide. So if you need help with wildlife problems, um, one of the best things you can do is consult a wildlife damage control agent. And these agents are trained through the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and NC State University. And um, I listed the website here. You can look them up online. There's a ton of information on this website and how to contact them. These are the people you want to reach out to for any of your depredation permits, um, which are free. If you do need any services, they do charge for services that they provide. Next slide. Um, and of course, you can also call or email the Durham County Master Gardeners for free advice. And we can't come out and provide services, but as you know, we can provide lots of information and we can definitely direct you to any resources that you need. Next slide. This is actually my last slide. I just listed some of the resources that I used for this talk. And um, I saw a, a bunch of things pop up. I couldn't follow all of the comments, but if there are any questions, um, happy to have questions, comments right now. And one thing I'll add to is that um, in general, when we get calls about wildlife, unless it's something that's, um, so we can do the easy questions. We can do the kind of like, uh, how do I take care of this question? But especially if someone has wildlife that they need taken care of, or they have kind of a more involved question, we do tend to point them to, um, to the Department of Wildlife um, and, and kind of get them there because they are much better at handling those questions. Um, two weeks ago, we had someone come in with a black bear problem. And I was like, pass. It's above my pay right. <laughs> you know, like that is when we pass right along. So um, just be aware of that, that there are a fair number of these we pass along. And, and somebody commented um, on the, the netting, the mesh netting. And I realized as I was going through this talk that I have completely eliminated all of that from my landscape because I too found that snakes were getting caught up in it. And I was actually getting quite good at getting the scissors and going out and now not with the copperhead, but, <laughs> but usually black snakes and you know just snipping right along their back and freeing all these poor snakes that would get caught in the netting. And, um, and I, I totally agree that it's, it's a hazard to snakes. And um, what you can do is you can look and like I said, over the years, there's so many more um, wider gauge, solid, more solid, I guess you call it a mesh rather than the flimsy netting that you can use that um, the snakes aren't gonna be able to, I hope get that snarled in. I haven't had the problem with the slightly wider gauge uh, meshes. So yeah, I, I, I really wouldn't recommend the netting as well. Awesome. So it seems like most of our comments were about squirrel acrobatics. Um, so not that many questions, just us being impressed with squirrels. Um, but I just want to say um, thanks to Alyssa and Sarah. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, the links to these will be up on the internet soon, and you guys will be getting your, your typical Thursday email. But let me know if you have any questions and we'll hang out for a little bit, but I, I think that's it for today. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Can't wait to meet everybody in 